first of all, I really, really, really want to thank you for this very important reason that you are here. And why is that important? Because it means that you are already beginning to ask the necessary questions to help us in this very important evolutionary time that we're experiencing right now. And that because you're asking these questions means that you're really looking for the other answers that you haven't been told so far. And that Robin and Cody bring this opportunity for all of us to get together. But it's you that is important because you are the people of change. And why this is important, congratulate you for being here. Thank you very much. And so the issues are that what we're going to talk about in, in my level of this is the biological connection because there is a biology behind everything we're talking about and this is very profound because we've also acquired a belief of more or less of victimization in our world of who are we, you know, we're just these genetic automatons, at least that's the belief out in the general public. There's a different understanding at the leading edge of science, but what really gets me upset is that information is not coming out to the public and that's where it's needed more than in the fields of science. And it deals with issues that I'm going to start talking about now, but here's what I want to tell you about. Please just write this website down. You can download articles about things that I'm talking about and about references. Please try, don't try to take notes when I'm going to talk because I'm going to try to put 12 hours into the next hour and 15 minutes. Okay? It'd be easier if you want to just listen to what I'm talking about, get the notes later and download them later. Okay? Basically, as you heard in that very long prologue that we got here. Uh, I have a career in medical education. I was trained as a cellular biologist, ended up at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine where I was teaching medical students basic understanding about science. Let me give you a couple of facts about that before we get off the ground. Something that I was giving those students back in those days. Number one, it deals with cells. And here's what I want you to understand. That while you look at yourself as a singular entity, that's a misperception. You are not a singular entity. The living things that make you up are the cells. You are a community of about 50 trillion cells. You are not a singular entity. Why is this relevant? Is because when you start to understand this community nature, and we also have a tendency as humans, our hubris is to look down and say, oh my God, anything less than human is not really intelligent. Well, I want to just stand here and give a little honor to the cells because it's their intelligence that provided for this body and for us to be here and and they have that intelligence. So your cells, every one of them, is a uniquely intelligent being in your body. And then who are you? Well, you're essentially collective amoebic consciousness. You are the conscious activity of all these cells. So that's number one. And number two is this. While you look at the human body and you think of all the wonderful and exciting things that humans can do in their physiology and their advanced mechanisms, let me give you an interesting fact. There's not one new function in the human that is not already present in every single cell. Every cell has a digestive, respiratory, excretory system, reproductive system. Every cell even has an immune system. And every cell has a nervous system. And why is this relevant? Because if you understand how the cell works and you're going to understand how the human works, you are made in the image of a cell. So I don't have to talk about humans with complexity when I can start to talk about the simplicity, which is really complex anyway, in a single cell. So I'd like to talk about single cells. And this is what I was talking about in my medical education classes about cellular biology. But when it comes to the control of cells, here's what was important. We all were looking for in biology, what is it that controls life? Well, life is this system of biology that you see in front of you, you yourself, and it's made out of cells, and the cells are made out of proteins. Proteins are the molecular building blocks that give rise to life. But the issue was, well, what controls the proteins? There are over 100,000 different proteins. What controls for the structure of each of these very complex molecules? Because that's where they thought, well, that would be what controls life. A hundred years after Charles Darwin came up with the idea, that the control was something that was physically passed from parent to child. And the reason why he came up with the control? Simple observation. That the traits of a child are related to the traits of the parent. And so there must be passing something from one generation to the next. And a hundred years of trying to identify what is being passed physically that controls it, we end up with a story of DNA. And DNA turns out to be the blueprints that make those molecular building blocks of your body so that the DNA controls the building block, the organization of those, and the building blocks are manifest as your life. So we got to this understanding that DNA was in charge. And it was a mistake, it was a mis an assumption, it was totally wrong because what they found was this, the DNA is a double helix 
and that if you split the double helix into single strands, single helices, here's what the experiment they did. They said is, well, yes, the DNA codes for the protein, but the next question, which was obvious, says, yeah, but what controls the DNA? Well, the experiment was simple. They took a single strand of DNA and put it into a beaker with building blocks of the molecules that make DNA. A single strand, they put it in the beaker and they pulled it back out after a while and it was a double strand. The idea was that one strand made the complement for the other strand. So they said, oh, we got it. DNA controls itself. DNA controls the proteins, DNA controls the cell. And Francis Crick, who was one of the co-founders with Watson on the DNA code, comes up with what is called, and I just love it, it's called the central dogma. <laughs> it's the equivalent of the Ten Commandments in biology. And what you can see is, what, the, what was the resolution? Well, you are protein. This is, your protein gives you your structure and your proteins give you your function. You are protein. Yeah, but where did it come from? Well, immediately it came just from RNA, which is actually a Xerox copy of the DNA. So they basically said, yes, this is who you are. Where did you come from? DNA. And that the information flowed only in one direction. DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. So when they were talking about this central dogma all the time, and it's in the textbook, central dogma, and I'm up there spouting it in the, you know, off the lectern, it almost was a church. Why? Because I asked at some point only after years of teaching it, what the heck does the word dogma mean? And I looked it up in the dictionary and was shocked to find that the word dogma means a belief based on religious persuasion and not scientific fact. I was teaching religion. And I was up there teaching about the God, genes. Everybody wants to know about the genes. And the idea was it was, it was never a scientific fact, yet we bought it and we passed it on and propagated it so that every school kid in the country today somewhere in their little elementary education gets the concept that genes control who they are, that genes are passed down through heredity. It's also referred to, in addition to central dogma, it's referred to as primacy of DNA. What is the meaning primacy? Primacy means first cause. So what were they saying? The primacy of DNA means the DNA is the first cause of everything in your life. Therefore, if anything's wrong or right, <laughs> things that are attributes or deficits, you go back to the DNA and that's where you put the credit. DNA did all that. Well, that's got a bit of an issue to it because basically it leads us to this concept. It was called genetic determinism. And what does that mean? Genes control your life. At the moment of conception, a set of genes are picked out of the uh, set from your mother and the father that come together in the zygote, and those genes are the pre-pattern for your whole life. That all of a sudden, at that moment of conception, your life is mapped out. It's determined by your genes. And why is this a problem? Well, here's what the problem is this. Do we pick the genes? As far as we know, not really. Can we change the genes? No, not really. Uh-oh, why is this a problem? The problem is this. I didn't pick them. I can't change them. They control my life. Then I am a victim of heredity. <laughs> and all of a sudden it says, well, what can you do about it? It's like, you can't do a damn thing about it. This is your life. <laughs> Except the medical people are real excited by it because basically what their plan was is first, if you have a problem, let's give you chemicals and fix you. That, that doesn't work very well. Okay, but then the next program was the Human Genome Project. And what was the purpose of that? Well, if I had a list of all the genes, then all I need to do is you come in with a problem and I'll find the gene that's related to that and I'll genetically engineer you and everything's gonna be better. This is where a cosmic joke enters into the picture. <laughs> and the cosmic joke goes like this. In order to have a genetically controlled human body, you need in excess of 100,000 and estimated to be 140,000 genes. And so the cosmic joke is when the Human Genome Project, was re the results are reported, there are less than 25,000 human genes. 25,000, you need 100 some thousand to go to the plan. What it says is, we were wrong. We completely misunderstood the nature of what it was all about. We gave credit to genes where we shouldn't have done that. And yet, the problem is this. Well, what I'm talking about is understood at leading edge science. The general public is still under the belief that they are victims of genes, and if anything goes wrong, it's their genes and heredity, and you just got to learn to live with it. Well, it's interesting because while I was teaching victimization to my medical students, 
then I also was doing research, and I was cloning stem cells. And I started cloning stem cells. Oh, I forgot about this part. <laughs> I have to tell you this little piece because in my cultures of cloning stem cells, I did this experiment, and it caused me to actually leave the university. Why? It's based on this. I said that the genes were presumed to be controlling life, and this is what I was teaching. The genes are essentially most all of them in the nucleus of the, of the cell. And so therefore we got the belief that the nucleus represented the brain of the cell because the genes control life, the genes are in the nucleus, therefore the nucleus controls life. The genes are the brain of the cell. But then when I started doing some experiments on some of my cultures, I started doing experiments where I removed the nuclei from the cells. So they had no genes in them. And why was this important? Well, the answer is simply based on this. If the brain is the nucleus of the cell, let me ask you a simple logic question. If you take the brain out of any living organism and throw it away, what is the consequence to the organism? What happens to the organism? It dies. Well, here's the issue. Yes, remove the brain from an organism, it dies. Here's what the observations were. Remove the nucleus from a cell, a process called enucleation, and guess what? Cell doesn't die. It goes on just doing what it was doing before. Its life is essentially unaffected, that it's still doing all the same things. It's eating, it's growing, it's moving around, it's recognizing other cells, it's avoiding toxins in the field, it's doing everything in a coordinated fashion with no genes in it. Now, essentially, the cell will die after a while, but let me tell you why the, genes, why, why the cell dies. Because in the process, when I remove the genes, I remove the blueprints of how to make the proteins. Well, as long as the cell had all the proteins necessary to function, it didn't need the blueprints. But if a protein wears out, and I need that protein to carry out a function, and I don't have a blueprint, I can't make it again. So I cannot reproduce the proteins. And as a result, uh, the cell would then suffer and begin to die. What was the point? Removing the genes did not change the coordinated life activities of the cell. It was still living, doing all this wonderful thing. So what was different about it? Well, the fact was, what it revealed was, no, the nucleus is not the brain of the cell. The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. <laughs> Why is it relevant? Well, science is a male-dominated profession, and since males think with this organ, then they made it the brain of the cell. <laughs> but the reality, the reality is, it's totally the gonad. It is reproduction. When I need to reproduce a part, I need to go to the nucleus. So that that's what was missing when I took the nucleus out of the cell. So what kind of work was I doing? Well, I was working with these stem cells. And what I learned was this first important fact. And the fact is this. Genes do not control biology. Why? Biology still has control even if there are no genes in it. So something else is involved with controlling biology. So I'm back there culturing these stem cells, and most of you have heard of stem cells, like this hot topic. I was culturing stem cells back in, uh, well, my first cultures of stem cells were 1967. So that was, uh, you know, a long time ago kind of stuff, right? And they taught me so much information that I actually had to resign my position because I realized what the cells were teaching me in the cultures were not what I was teaching medical students. And the discrepancy, I just couldn't live, you know, it's like I can't go in there and tell lies that genes control life when I know they don't. What was I working on? These special stem cells in your body. What are stem cells? Stem cells are the equivalent of embryonic pluripotent cells, meaning this. In your body right now, there are cells scattered throughout your body that are embryonic cells. And what's their function? Well, if you damage something or you need to build something back up, these cells then can contribute to the growth of whatever you're building or replacing in your body. All of us have stem cells. And what was interesting to me, and I just love it because it's a joke, that we are now pushing for stem cell research. <laughs> Why? Well, apparently, we have stem cells, but they don't work, and so we have to give them to the pharmaceutical company, and they will figure out how they make them work so that we can take drugs to make them work. And the point is, do you think God gave you stem cells to wait for the pharmaceutical industry to figure out how to make them work? <laughs> the issue is you have them. The question is, why aren't they working? Well, part of it started to come through in my understanding about the cultures. I cultured these very identifiable, very specific stem cells called myoblasts. They're muscle precursors. And what I would do is isolate these single cells from muscle. And then I plate them in a culture. And you see these little dots behind these, these strappy looking things? See the little dots all around here? Those dots are these cells. 
When these cells start to grow into a colony, they ultimately at some point differentiate and form these very large muscle cells that actually contract in the petri dish. And they are derived from these single cells. And these are committed cells committed to form muscle. At least that's what I was working on. And at one point I started to change the culture environment a little bit. And as I changed the environment, these myoblasts, which gave rise to these cells, changed and became these kind of fibroblasts and gave rise to these cells. And they formed something completely different. They formed bone matrix. And I said, wait, wait, if I take the same cells and change the environment, they form bone. And then I found out if I change the environment a little bit more, the same cells would form fat cells. And then all of a sudden I started to realize, what's controlling the cells? They all have the same genes, but in this environment they form muscle, in this environment they form bone, in this environment they form fat. What controlled the cells? It wasn't inside the cell, it was the environment that activated the gene expression. Why is this relevant? Because if I took my petri dish and put it in an optimum growth environment, the cells grow and they flourish and divide and become healthy and do everything. If I take the same dish and move it to a less than optimum culture environment, they start to get sick. The dividing starts to go down. They don't express their fate anymore. They begin to die. And if I take them from that bad environment as they're beginning to die and put them back into the good environment, they recovered their life again. What's the relevance about this? The simplest conclusion is this. You are a Petri plate with 50 trillion cells in it. <laughs> put it in a good environment and it will grow. Put it in a bad environment and it will stop growing. All of a sudden, it wasn't your cells that were pre-programmed to be sick or not. It was the way you responded to the environment that controlled the expression of the cells. So where we were giving credit to the genes, we now have to look and say, wait, the genes are important, but the control comes from the environment. So I write this up in a paper back in 1977, and I write a fine structural analysis of normal, I didn't have another word at the time, modulated. They changed their behavior. I couldn't figure out what it was. Tried to talk to my friends. They were all into genes. They look at me and go, we don't have time for that. And after a while, I realized there, it was such a deaf ear that I walked out of the university because I thought, if you can't see how important the environment is, then I can't stay here and do this. And at some point, I came back into uh, biology again because Stanford was open enough to consider weirdos like myself. And, and it was wonderful because then I also had an opportunity to be in amongst the likes of, of people like Bill Tiller and Carl Prebrum because Stanford was a very unique environment to offer this. And so I publish, I do this work at Stanford working with human blood vessel cells, same thing. And I get this, uh, I get the cover of differentiation. Uh, and it was, I really wanted the cover of Rolling Stone, but, <laughs> uh, and what do I get? A uh, microvessel, that means blood vessel, capillary, endothelial cells, transdifferentiation, new word. Because I figured, hey, Stanford, you can't use a cheap word like modulated from, you know, Wisconsin. So I used the big $10 word, transdifferentiation, meaning that if I change the environment, the cells change their fate. So I do this for a while, and about 1992, after I repeated the experiments and published them, and I realized at some point they're still interested in genes and they don't want to talk about this, I leave and decide I might as well just talk to the people directly. So I end up writing this book, which took a, a number of years to get the science so people could read it, because the first time I wrote a manuscript, it was so scientific. <laughs> they were so embarrassed to tell me they couldn't understand a damn word that I wrote, they, they just avoided me like the plague. So I finally got it down into human words here. And what do I write? Now, here's what I write. I want you to note, in chapter two, in chapter two, I lay out the scientific evidence to show you genes do not control biology. I also introduce you to the exciting discovery of epigenetics, a new field of biology is unraveling the mysteries of how the environment influences the behavior of cells without changing the genetic code. And so what do I call chapter two? Well, I call it, it's the environment, stupid. And, and uh, basically, that's a takeoff from the Democrats who were saying it was the economy, stupid. And I thought this was a funny title. And yet, when I wrote this book, and most people, the conventional people, looked at me and said, Bruce, what the bleep do you know? <laughs> and I had to stand there saying, yeah, but all this is still, I support this, the experiments support this, and all this was really great. And then, guess what happened just two months ago, or three months ago now, it was actually May, so it's even maybe a few more months ago, issue of Nature one of the most prestigious journals in the world, Nature. There's an article. What's it about? 
stem cells are engaged in a constant crosstalk with their environment. Biologists are fast realizing. <laughs> what do you think the article is called? I love this. It's the ecology, stupid. I rest my case, you see. <laughs> it took them some years, but they're getting there. <laughs> so the question is now, what do we learn from all this? Well, what we're going to learn is how human cells work. How do they work? Well, let me explain this, and this is where I have to give you the scientific facts enough so that the conclusions make sense that I'm going to give you in a few minutes. How do cells work? Well, the easiest way to show you how a cell will work is use the transmission from my car. And the reason, because a cell is made out of parts, like a transmission. But this is an important diagram because it's called an exploded diagram, and it shows two different things. A, it shows all the individual parts that go into making a transmission. All the individual gears, nuts, bolts, bol you know, washers, bearings, cotter pins, all the different parts. But it also shows this. The parts aren't just thrown into the transmission. The parts are grouped into assemblies, and the assemblies interact with assemblies. So basically, it says there's an order going on inside here. Well, the truth is this. The cell is like the transmission. The parts are made out of proteins. So when I look at a cell and I open it up, I got all these parts, all different shapes, over 100,000 different kinds of proteins. They don't look like man-made parts because they're these organic parts. They're, they're nature. <laughs> And they don't look like man-made parts, but they're the equivalent of steel because they're the same parts that are essentially in each one of you. That's why I can exchange parts with each other, and that's why people can share organs and things like that. They're almost the same. And so that the cell is like a transmission, and the gears are made out of the proteins. Well, what is responsible for giving each gear its so unique shape? And there are over 100,000 of them, as I said. And the answer to that, let me use a protein that is in every one of you right now. If it isn't, you're not here. This protein is called calmodulin. You need it for your life. This is one of over 100,000 different shaped proteins. Well, it looks like a whole bunch of foamy soap bubbles, the way the biochemist illustrated right here. Actually, each of these little bubbles represents an atom. And so this is the complex molecule. Now, what's interesting about this is calmodulin has a unique shape, makes it different than all the other proteins. But it's, while it looks very soap bubble-like, it's the equivalent of steel for this reason. Take calmodulin out of the person sitting next to you, put it in your body, it will work in your body the same as yours because they're almost all exactly the same. The question is, where does the shape of a protein come from? And so to show you that, really, uh, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, what is called the backbone, that there's a backbone that gives each protein its unique shape. And why I'm going to uh, talk about right now is interesting is this. This is a very rare opportunity where you can say that all proteins are built on the same pattern. So now when I say this in like in a couple of minutes, I can describe the entire field of 100,000 proteins. It goes like this. All proteins are linear strings of beads. The beads are called amino acids. There are about 20 different kinds of amino acids. You can go to the health food store. When you're buying amino acids, you're buying the building blocks that make up the beads. Well, the important part about this is what makes each protein unique? And the answer is this. Each one has a very specific and unique characteristic alignment of amino acids of the 20 different ones making them up. If I did this right, I would have 20 different color beads, but I don't have that many different ones. But the point is this. The sequence of the amino acids is unique for each different protein. But then if you look at it, there's a little misleading thing about this model because it suggests that each protein looks like a strand of spaghetti. That's incorrect because each amino acid is not the same shape. It doesn't, this is the failure of this model, so I go to this model. And I say, let's say there are 20 different amino acids, which there are, and each amino acid has a unique shape that says there are 20 different shapes. It's like a giant tinker toy set, okay? I'm going to show you three different pipe fittings. Am I, yeah, I'm standing in a light, okay? Three different pipe fittings, each with a different shape. First pipe fitting, the yellow one, is straight. The second pipe fitting is red, and it's got a 45, can you see that? I'm looking direct in the light, can you see it? Okay, the, this is a 45 degree bend on this one. And the third amino acid that I'm gonna use has a 90 degree bend. So this is three out of 20 shapes. That's all I need you to know, there's a lot more shapes. But they are like poppet beads because they plug into each other. This is called a peptide bond. So I bind it together. And guess what? Now I'm creating a chain. But no longer is that chain that flexible, you know, like poppet bead chain. Now there's a structure like a hard, rigid backbone that gives the shape to this particular uh, assembly of proteins. So as I'm assembling my amino acids into a protein backbone, this is the shape. And all of a sudden you say, ah, 
It's like the poppet beads because, look, one color followed another color, another color, another color. It's a chain. But because they're unique shapes, it's not a flexible chain like this, but it has a unique characteristic shape. Is that evident to you, I hope? Here's the next point I have to ask you, though, very clearly. Do you recognize this point? This is the real critical one. If I disassemble this and reassemble it in a different sequence, using a different sequence, will I get the same shape backbone, yes or no? Okay, well then you've got the fundamental understanding of why each of the proteins is unique and different. Each one has a different assembly of these subunits called amino acids. So basically, the amino acids uh, join, up, join up in a backbone, make the proteins. The proteins become like gears in that transmission. Well, let me give you this picture of a watch. Can you imagine in your head, when gear A turns, it turns gear B, and when gear B turns, it turns gear C. Can you imagine that? Now I say, well, wait. How about if I blew proteins up big enough to be the size of gears? So I lay on top of this, instead of metal gears, I put protein gears. Okay? And I get a question though. In your head, can you imagine when protein A turns, it turns protein B, and when protein B turns, it turns protein C? Can you imagine that? And well, then I say, okay, get rid of all the man made parts. Boom. What do we have left? A machine. It's made out of proteins. In your head, can you imagine when protein A turns, it turns protein B, and then protein C is turned? Can you see that? Well, that's like, remember in the transmission I said there are assemblies? Assemblies of proteins that interact to carry out a function are called pathways. Now, here's a, I'll throw a word out, see if you can figure this out. What is a digestive pathway? It's a process of digestion carried out by what? A series of proteins acting as gears, one turning the other, with the result digestion, right? Okay, you got that one. Here's a better one. Respiration pathway. What is that? A group of proteins assemble together when they interact, do respiration. Okay, if you, in the last group of people who have gotten that yet, here's the last one. <laughs> Muscle contraction pathway. A group of proteins that assemble and cause my... Okay, what's the nature of the cell? It's got all these assemblies of proteins carrying on the function, but here's the problem. In order to have function, it's got to move. And movement is where life comes from. Life is movement. It's characterized by movement. Here's the point. If the proteins don't move, you have a cadaver. That's what a dead person is, a man, person who's just all proteins and no movement. So I want to tell you about the secret of life right now, secret of life, OK? Uh, spotlight, OK, secret of life. I'm going to show it to you, and don't be mad at me because it's so simple it'll probably irritate you, okay? Here's how it works. This is a backbone, and just like a human backbone, the amino acids are like vertebrae, and guess what I can do with my backbone? I can twist it, flex it, rotate it, change my shape. Ah! Protein, backbone, flex, rotate, twist, change shape. Ah, the question is this, but in the body, protein has a conformation or shape that it prefers. And I'm going to show you two shapes, and I'm going to ask you which one of these uh, shapes would be preferred by my protein. But before I do that, I give you one fact. The two yellow amino acids at the end are negatively charged. Yellow and yellow, negative. I'm going to show you two shapes. You tell me which is more stable. Shape one, shape two. The reason simply, like charges repel each other, so this is stable. Okay. Now, I introduce the secret of life, the polystyrene ball. <laughs> what does it represent? I'll tell you what it represents, an environmental signal. What's an environmental signal? And the answer is a chemical, a drug, a hormone, a growth factor. Those are chemical environmental signals. But what other kind of signals are there? Well, especially in this group, you should start to realize that we don't have to focus on the physical reality because other signals are just energy fields. And this is what the quantum physics was all about. Quantum physics says energy doesn't have to be material. It could be wave-like functions going through the field. Okay? So the relevance is, well, I can't show you an invisible field. I'll use this model and say both chemical and invisible fields will do the same thing. So let me show you with the chemical. Now here's the, here's the secret part of this. What's the charge here at the yellow? Okay, now here's this. This chemical is positively charged, but on a quantity level, quantity, 
There's more positive charge in this polystyrene ball than there is negative charge in the yellow amino acid. You got that? Okay, now watch. The ball, the drug, the hormone is coming through the environment, gets near the protein. What's going to happen when this gets close? They attract, positive and negative, right? The signal binds. What's the charge here? What's the charge here? Is this more stable or is this one more stable? Now watch what happens. If the signal comes off, what's the protein going to do now? Move back. That's the secret of life. Okay. <laughs> what's the secret of life? The secret of life is this. The proteins give you your physical body. They're the building blocks. But life comes from the fact that the proteins can change shape. But to change shape, you need more than the protein. You need the, the signal. Okay? So now when we look at this, we go and we say, how does it work? Well, let's give a model. My proteins are gears. That there's the equivalent of a lock. And that certain proteins have certain keys. The keys are the environmental signals. So when the signal isn't bound to the protein, nothing's happening. But at some point, if the signal binds to the protein, it's like the polystyrene ball, boom, it causes the motion, the gears move, the function is carried out. If the signal detaches, the motion stops. I can control the action by whether I provide the signal or take away the signal. The environment offers the signals. So the environment is controlling the action. The genes are blueprints to make the parts, but the genes alone don't say when the parts are going to be used or why or how. It's the environment that does that, okay? So uh, we go back to CalModulin, the space fill version, the backbone version. Let me just show you. This is the actual movement of CalModulin in the body when it responds to a calcium signal. And this is the actual movement. And this, you may say, well, it's only just did it a little like this. What, what big deal? When you have like a million proteins and they're all moving a little tiny bit, collectively, it creates life. Every one of them has its own little action. So here's the summary of biology. You now have enough biology to understand life, and it goes like this. You are made out of protein. But the protein gives you your structure. A cadaver is all protein. What's the cadaver missing? The signals. OK? Well, why is the signal important? Because the signal comes from the environment. But what are the signals? Well, to use a term that uh, Lynn McTaggart's book describes, the field. I'll talk about the field, the environment. Where's the environment? From you to the end of the universe. That's the environment. The signals come from that. Medicine says all signals have to be molecules because medicine is Newtonian. And it believes the body is a physical device made out of physical parts that interact with physical parts. Newtonian physics doesn't entertain the concept of invisible energy fields influencing things. This is why if molecules are the signals and the signals control protein, why do you think they sell drugs? Drugs are molecules that are supposed to be signals to control your functions. And they stick with that. Unfortunately, they're totally out of date scientifically by about 80 years. And the reality is you better bring energy into the picture because energy reveals itself to be pure energy versus physical chemicals are 100 times more effective in transmitting information than our chemicals. And that when we return the energy that controls the body, that would essentially be the vital forces that people talked about years ago, that there's a vital force, an energy running through your body. Yes, it is, and it's quantum physics is involved with that. And the relevance, if you can't see it, medicine doesn't want to talk about it. And so they don't. And they just stick with the molecules. Why? Not because medicine wants to stick with the molecules. It's the pharmaceutical industry that sells them, and they control the medical industry. So the point is you want to get out of that chemical business. And the fact is, well, how does life work? But I showed you how life works. Signal joins protein, makes behavior. You saw it. Signal plus protein equals movement. Movement is generating behavior. The movement is used to do work. Now the issue is, now that you understand how life works, then I say, yeah, but what if you, your behavior is off? We call it a disease, a dis-ease. It's not working right. Now you already have all the information to answer this question. If you are expressing a disease, what can you attribute it to? There's only two things. Take the arrow backwards. It's either the proteins are screwed up or the signals are screwed up. Well, what's the relevance about that? Well, when it comes to the protein, if you have defects in making your proteins, those are called birth defects. 
and that's less than 5% of the population on this planet can tell you legitimately, my life doesn't work well because I got defective proteins. That means 95% of the population cannot use that excuse. And if those people in that 95% are sick and express a dis-ease, we can't go back and blame it on the proteins. Then what's left? The signal. So I said, well, yeah, but how can a signal mess up? Well, I'm going to show you there's only three ways a signal can mess up. Number one, the first thing is trauma. If I fall off the podium right here and wrench my back and my spinal cord gets all wrenched around and the signal can't go from my brain down to the rest of the parts of my body, of course the signal's messed up. Of course I'm going to have a disease. So trauma is one source, interfering with the passage of the signal. Second, and the second is toxins. Yes, if you put chemicals in your body that are not supporting the propagation of the signals in a good way or distort the signal, then the toxins interfere with your life. Therefore, avoid eating all the garbage that the mass producers are making. Organic foods, natural things, get back to them without all the exogenous chemicals that are distorting the system. And now the third and the most important influence on dis-ease is infecting the signal is thought. Auto-suggestion. Why is it relevant? Relevance is simply this. There is nothing wrong with a biological system. What's wrong is that the signals are inappropriate and they're being sent at a wrong time or just the inappropriate signal responding to the world. Why is that relevant? Because there's nothing physically wrong with you. But you may show a disease. But the disease has no physical correlation that there's a cause. It has to do with your mind and bringing the mind back into the picture because the mind sends the signals. And if the signals are inappropriate, then you adjust your biology and it's out of context for the world that you're living in. Now you're expressing a disease at that point. So I say, well, what controls these signals in the cell? Well, in the human, the signals are controlled by the brain. So what controls them in the cell? Well, first of all, it's not this structure. That's the gonad. We can take it out, the nucleus. It doesn't do it. What controls the signals? And the answer is the membrane, the skin. And while you might say, no, wait, my God, Bruce, I just heard you a few minutes ago. Didn't you tell me I was made in the image of a cell? Yes. Then are you suggesting that my brain is my skin? And the answer is absolutely. Why? Well, if you took embryology, you would know that. Why? When an egg is fertilized, it's called a zygote. The zygote div divides, forms a ball of cells. It's called a blastula just a ball of cells. And then shortly after a ball of cells form, the cells stratify into three layers. Layers are called derms. And the three layers, the outer layer is called the ectoderm. The middle layer is called the mesoderm. The inner layer is called the endoderm. Each of these layers or derms gives rise to very specific organs and tissues in the human body. There are only two derivatives from the ectoderm. Skin and the central nervous system comes from the skin. It's derived from it. So we are made in the image of the cell. And so that makes it important to understand that the cell has a brain. It is the skin in this particular time. Yeah, but now let's go back and say, well, how does the skin get involved with this? And the answer is, remember the gears and the environmental signal? Yeah, but the gears are not outside the cell. The gears are inside the cell. What does that mean? The gears are under the membrane. The signal comes from the environment. For the signal to get to the gears, it has to cross through the membrane to get to the gears to drive the function. Why is this relevant? The membrane serves as a switching device. It reads the environmental signals and then relays the signals back to the inside of the system. Well, how does it work? Signals come from the environment. They get picked up at the membrane. There's a switch built right into the membrane for every signal that the cell responds to. What's the function of the switch? First of all, to respond to the environmental signal. That's function one. And the second function is to what's missing from my chart. You saw this chart. Signal, protein, what's missing? the signal comes in and joins to the protein, right? So the switch has two functions. One, read the primary environmental signal. What's going on in your world? And then upon doing that, send in a secondary signal, which is called a second messenger for biochemists. Send that in, and that's the one that joins to the protein and makes the behavior. So the switch has two parts. Now let me show you. One part's called receptor, one part is called the effector. Do you have receptors? Give me the big guns. Ears, eyes. Nose, mouth, 
hand, touch, pain, pressure, heat. Oh, hey, what are your, where are your receptors located? They're all derivatives of the skin. And they're reading that environment. And so in the cell, the equivalent of an eye, ear, or nose are proteins. But they have antennas on them. And the antennas are tuning forks. And they're tuned to environmental signals. So if an environmental signal shows up, resonance... Oh, wait, I already should ask you. You already have this lesson. It's already down under your belt already. What happens when a signal complements with a protein? What happens to the protein? It changes shape. It moves, right? When the receptor reads the environmental signal, the receptor changes shape. And when it does so, it connects to this intermediate thing called the G protein, which then connects to this protein, which is called an effector. There are a variety of different ones. And this, this effector is the one that sends the signal down into the cell to control the function. So here's a switch, and it has two parts. The receptor is responding to the primary signal. The signal is sent down through the protein, connecting like dominoes, bang, bang, bang. This one connects to this one, connects to this one, and then this one sends a secondary signal that goes into the cell and controls the protein gears. Does that make sense? Okay, now here's the point. This is a model of one switch. When I got to this point, I was being the full reductionist scientist that I could ever be, taking it down to the bottom nuts and bolts and going, yeah, this is the switch, only to stop long enough to realize, my God, there's over 100,000 such switches on the surface of the cell at any one time. If you want to know what the cell is going to do, you have to have an awareness of over 100,000 different signals at the same time. What's that going to do? All of a sudden, the simplicity of one switch gets complex. Not that the function of a switch is complex, it's the numbers that get complex. But how does it work? Well, let me give you a demonstration of it. I'll show you the uh, model of the membrane with the uh, receptor, with the antenna on it. This is a channel. And let me show you. Here comes the uh, processor protein. But look at the shape, and look at the shape. They don't connect, so the switch is not connected. There's now a separate receptor. A primary signal comes from the environment, changes the shape, causes this one to couple to this one, causes this to change shape, and this sends in a secondary signal into the cell. This signal is the one that controls the proteins. This signal comes from the field. When the signal leaves, watch what happens. Shape changes, the switch is broken. Watch it one more time. It goes like this. This is a two-part switch, receptor, effector. There's a connector called the G protein, but if they're not connected, the switch isn't working. But the connections, these shapes don't match, so I can't connect it. But the moment an environmental signal shows up, the shape changes, causing this one to couple to this one, causing this to change shape, this sends a signal in and controls the gears. Does that make sense? This is a single switch. Now, there's 100,000 such switches, but here's the important part. What are these switches? Well, these are switches that control functions inside the cell. What activates them? Environmental signals. But here's the interesting fact. What's the name of the switch? The receptor effector. <laughs> Who cares? That's not anybody's interest. Let me define it, though, and it will become personally interesting. The function of the receptor is awareness of the environment. That's what your eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. It's awareness of the environment. But the function of the effector is to send a signal into the cell, a physical signal that controls those gears. So I say, by definition, get the definition of the switch. Awareness of the environment through a physical sensation. And I say, why am I putting it out this way? Because then I'll go to the dictionary and I'll show you the name that is personal to you about the switch that controls biology. The name of the switch is perception. The definition of perception, awareness of the elements of environment through physical sensation. The surface of the cell is covered with perception switches. As the signal shows up, it activates like a reflex behavior, a function that goes on inside the cell. It's your perception that controls biology. Perception, as you see it, causes you to move your biology to respond to what you see. Now comes the question, say, what about the DNA? You notice we just had a wonderful discussion about how cells work, and not once did we bring up the word DNA. And the answer is, because DNA does not control the functions of cells. That's the most important fact. But what is the DNA? Well, the DNA is a blueprint to make the proteins. But here's what's interesting about that blueprint. I need the blueprint if I don't have the protein. So a signal shows up to the cell, and the cell says, geez, I've got to engage in this response. There's no protein. Where am I going to get the protein from? 
The answer is the blueprints. And where are the blueprints? They're part of the DNA, which is part of the hereditary material. So if you open up the nucleus of the cell, you remove the chromosomes. And the chromosomes are hereditary material. Yeah, but what are they made out of? 50% DNA, 50% protein. What's the function of the protein? Well, I'll tell you why we don't know what the function of protein is for a long time. Because once everybody said, DNA, that's it. Central dogma, DNA, God. We don't need the stinking proteins. Let's just study the DNA. So they isolate the chromosomes. They get them out. They separate the DNA from the protein. They save the DNA to do the experiments. And they threw away the protein for 50 years as space filler. We now know what the protein is. And I'm going to tell you right now, the next slide, the next two slides, are information that when grokked or known by the public, will change civilization. That's a bold statement, but it's a true statement, I believe, for this reason. Watch. How does it work? It works like this. A chromosome is a core of DNA surrounded by a sleeve of protein. In fact, some of the proteins are called regulatory protein. What an interesting name, regulatory protein. How does it work? Let me explain this. My arm and sleeve is a chromosome. The sleeve is the protein. The DNA is the bare arm. If I take a magic marker and write the genetic code, you know, all the A, T, Cs, and Gs, I write the genetic code and I say, this is the genetic code for blue eyes, the gene for blue eyes. And I hold up my arm. Can you read the gene for blue eyes, yes or no? Yes. I say, yeah, but what does it look like when it's back in the cell, not in the test tube? Well, back in the cell, it's part of a chromosome, looks like this. Can you read the gene for blue eyes, yes or no? If you want to read the gene for blue eyes, what do you got to do? Take the sleeve off. What's the sleeve made out of? What caused the protein to change shape so it should come off? Ah, now you're ahead of 99% of the people on this planet in regard to how it works. And this is exactly how it works. It's called epigenetic, oops, go back, don't do that. Epigenetic control. What does it mean? Well, when I say genetic control, what does that mean? Control by genes. If I say epigenetic control, what does that mean? And the word epi, just tell you about it, means above, like epidermis, above the dermis. When I say above, now read it literally. Control above the genes. Oh, for all you victims of genetic determinism, apparently the control is above the genes. Well, how does it work? It works simply like this. The chromosome is a core of DNA, a sleeve of protein, that the DNA are gene segments, one after the other lined up. At the beginning of each gene segment, there's a special protein called a regulatory protein. Now watch how it works. If we go into the cell and we look at the chromosome in the nucleus, a signal comes from the environment. A signal complements the protein lock and key. When a signal binds to a protein, it causes the protein to change shape, move. Watch, boom, it moves. And now I can read the genetic code. And so what do I need to do is bring something up to copy that genetic code. So I bring up a protein, a protein that's called a polymerase. And this polymerase is going to come up here and make a copy of the DNA, but the copy is called RNA. And that's the blueprint that's going to go out to the cell and be used to make a protein. But now that I have the blueprint, I don't need the gene. So the signal pops off and the gene is quiescent. And what was the point? This time, watch it again. Tell me, take notes. Tell me what the DNA does in the process. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Watch that DNA. Here we go. Come on, DNA. Do, do that control your life stuff. Come on, baby. Come on, DNA. Do it. Come on, DNA. Come, come D please. The DNA was passive in the entire process. The DNA is a blueprint. We have so misunderstood it for years that we talk about genes being on and off, a blueprint being on and off. The reality is this. Go to an architect's office, he's working on a blueprint, and you stand over his shoulder and you say to that architect, excuse me, is that blueprint on or off? <laughs> yeah, laugh, but the reality is he'll look at you and go, what the hell are you talking about on or off? It's a blueprint. The reality is there is no on and off to a gene. You're either reading the gene or you're not reading the gene, but it's not up to the blueprint to determine what's being read. If the blueprints control that, then all the architect has to do is drive by a building site, throw the blueprints out in the lot, and come back a couple months later, and the house will be there. 
It's what reads the DNA. Well, why is this relevant? Because I taught the central dogma. This is the, you know, the dogma. It's written in all the books right now. DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein, primacy of DNA. Wrong. Why? Because we're the regulatory proteins. Oh, oh, let's add them. Yeah, the regulatory proteins cover up the DNA. Yeah, but what controls the regulatory proteins? Oh, the environmental signal. It's not the primacy of DNA. It's the primacy of the environment. The environment controls the genes. As you move from one environment to another environment, you change your genes. Even identical twins are born with the same set of genes every day of their life. They diverge by their life experiences. So they've looked at their genetic readout and found that they read different genes in their genome as they experience life differently. Your life is based on your experiences controlling your DNA, not your DNA controlling your life experiences. Complete opposite understanding. Perception controls genes. Those environmental signals are what control the genes. So when I come back to it, I say, conclusion. Well, perception controls behavior because environmental signals activate proteins and make movement. That is behavior. Yeah, but perception controls genes because environmental signals activate the regulatory proteins, which in turn allow the reading of the gene. So that, and I don't have the time to go into the third one, which is as and more important in some sense, is that perception can rewrite the genetic code. When you're under stress, you will rewrite your genes. It's built into every one of your cells. You have genetic engineering genes. The function of these genes is if you find stress that the body cannot seem to get out of, the body will make an effort to change its structure to get out of the problem. And of course, the issue is this. What if your perception wasn't real <laughs> and you change your genes? Now you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> and we now find a very important fact. 95% of cancer has no genetic linkage. 95% of cancer is a response of the individual cells to their experiencing life. And if you change your experiences, you can change the presence of that cancer. That's how it works. So, we're left with this. Perception controls biology. Now the question is real important. Where do perceptions come from? Well, I'm going to tell you my understanding of it in my, in my terms because when we start talking the words conscious and subconscious and all these words, every person that gets up here really stems from their own definition. I have to tell you what mine is. So first of all, I'll start with the first perceptions are built into the system. They're called instincts. You were born with them. They were passed hereditarily from one person to the next. That you, uh, you can be a baby, an infant, you put your hand in your fire, man, you're going to pull that hand out of the fire. It's a reflex behavior. A child can swim the moment it's born. It's genetic instincts. Come out of the birth canal, swim like a dolphin. No problem. Another important fact. You were all born with the innate ability to heal yourself. Everyone has that. It's instincts. But I'm going to tell you something. Life experiences can change the instincts. Life experiences can cancel an instinct. I'll give you an example. Every baby is born with the ability to swim. But you watch that little baby when it's a neonate and a little toddler. Every time it's near water, what do the parents do? Oh my God, the baby's by the brook. The baby's by the pool. The baby's by the creek. The baby's by the bathtub. What's the point? The baby acquires perceptions. The perceptions, which we'll talk about, come from the parents. That every time the baby gets near water, it says, yes, that's water. And you know what? It kills me. Why? Because every time I get near it, look at my parents, they're going nuts over there. So now you've built in the belief that water is dangerous. And then all of a sudden at five years old, you think, Johnny, it's time for him to swim. Let's buy him a bathing suit. And as you're trying to throw Johnny in the water, he's like a cat with claws screaming his body head off because you're trying to kill me. And guess what? Johnny gets in the water and cannot swim. And he was genetically endowed to do so. And I'll tell you another thing. You all heard this, most of you, when you were a kid. Oh, you're sick? We have to take you to the doctor. Why is this irrelevant? Because in your developmental period, your perceptions tell you that if you are sick, it's not up to you to heal yourself. You have to go to somebody else. And therefore, guess what? You cancel your innate ability until you do what? See the doctor. You know what's interesting? Many people get better on the way to the doctor. They didn't even have to see them because it was just a step you inserted before healing could occur. You all have the innate ability to heal yourself unless you believe you can't. Okay? 
So that's what we're talking about, genetics instincts. Subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, my definition, is the brain that was there before consciousness evolved. So that if there's a brain before consciousness, that would be what, if you add consciousness, then everything that was there before consciousness would be subconscious, okay? Subconscious. So that's my definition on that, the brain before consciousness. Its function, to store learned habits. That's its entire function. It is a repository of learned habits. The conscious mind is unique because the conscious mind is creative programming as compared to the subconscious mind, which is reflexive replay. Replay, 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 okay? Conscious mind is creative, okay? What do these represent? Genetics, nature. It's in your nature to do these, pull your arm out of the fire business. It's in your nature to be able to swim, okay? Ah, but learned habits are from experiences of life. Nurture. And all the years, which is more powerful? Nature, nurture, nature, nurture, nurture, you know, back and forth. It's a moot point. I'll tell you why. The third one overpowers both of them. Consciousness. With consciousness, you can rewrite any program that you got in your nurture. And with consciousness, you can go back and change the readout of the genes. Consciousness trumps them both. And yet, where is consciousness? Well, most people don't use it, but we'll talk about why. Okay? Now, the nature of this next step... Oh, my God, how many minutes? I got a couple of minutes. Go fast. Okay. When do you start getting perceptions? I want to show you this. This is a, a sonogram. It's an experiment. I need to show it to you. It's based on the fact that we're observing a, uh, a fetus in development. In our embryology teaching in medical school, we teach that the brain doesn't really function until right near birth, and then really after birth really begins a great spurt of development, and then begins to really function. We now know that is completely wrong. By midway through pregnancy, the fetus is downloading experiences from the environment and learning them if they're repeated. Why is that relevant? A father can talk through the abdominal wall to the fetus as it's developing. The voice will be understood by that fetus. When the baby is born, the father opens his mouth, says a word, the baby will immediately look and know who the father is. You can play baby music. When the music is played when the baby is born, it will have all the memories of this. What's the point? Well, you're going to... Oh, don't leave me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Okay, I'm gonna play, here's the sonic, oh, what happened? Watch this, it's in Italian. Watch it again. It's in Italian, doesn't make a difference, arguments are the same all over the world. I want you to show you something. The fetus is responding to all environmental stimuli, watch it. Watch. As we were all developing, we were downloading information about our world that was provided by our parents. Whether the child is wanted or not, it's known that you have already been programming the child before it's born. And it goes through this process. But then, once the child's born, the process is even better. And this is an experiment they did in Japan with this uh, bonobo chimp, and they were teaching this uh, mother a program where she would activate a computer, and a kanji script, Japanese script, would come up with a color. And on the bottom of the screen was a color bar. And if the chimp could identify the color that the script represented and push the right color, a coin would come out of the computer. And then the chimp could take the coin to a vending machine and get like a banana or an apple or some kind of treat. <laughs> well, they were teaching the mother this. She had this little baby chimplet, you know, and she holds it like under her arm. And she's doing all this stuff. And what took days and weeks for the chimp to really learn that this little baby infant was being held for a short time. One day, the mother goes and takes the coin she receives and goes to the vending machine, leaves the chimp who can't even walk. The chimp pulls itself up to the computer, activates the computer, the script comes on, picks the color bar, the coin comes out, and the baby grabs it. The research people are like, <laughs> who taught the baby how to do that? And the relevance is in this, and my God, this is so important because we were there. It suggests that infants pick up such skills solely by observation and don't have to be actively coached by their parents. Meaning this, a child learns everything by just observing it. It doesn't have to, you don't have to teach it, it observes it. Every movement you make as a parent is completely downloaded and learned without any conscious processing. And in fact, what we now recognize is this that while human adults have a whole range of EEG activity, brain wave activity, that goes from the lowest delta to the highest, which is uh, gamma, which is the new higher one, 
uh, that we, during the day, are up and down all over the place, all ranges of frequencies. Children are not. Children, when they're born, are predominantly in delta, the lowest EEG activity for the first two years of their life. For us, that's unconscious. For a child, it means really the, the child's like behind a plate glass window. It's observing reality but can't get involved because it's muscle, the motor coordination isn't working right. The sensory information's coming in, the motor is not developed on the way out. It's observing, it's downloading. From two until six, the child predominantly is in a theta brain state, which is imagination. Of course, that's where kids live between two and six, the imaginary world, mixing the two together, becoming that. After six, they start expressing 12, they start jumping up to beta, which is focused like schoolroom consciousness. Why is this relevant? The first six years of a child's life, it doesn't express the EEG activity of consciousness. The first six years, it's in delta and theta, which are called the hypnagogic state, the programmable state. A child is in a trance. It's just observing everything and downloading it. It watches how the father treats the mother, how the mother responds back. How the father talks to kids is different than how the father talks to adults. It's even different than how the father talks to the policeman. And every one of these are known. And if you have a kid, you got to laugh, and you probably did the first time that child used a swear word. Why? Because it wasn't used out of context. It was so perfect that you understood exactly what they were talking about. <laughs> what was the point? The point is, consciousness doesn't begin until after this. This is why the Jesuits were so damn proud of They knew this. They would say, you give us a kid till it's six or seven, it'll belong to the church for the rest of its life. Because once you program it, it's in there. It's in that subconscious. And the relevance about this is, this is a programmable state. It's very important. It's a super learning state. A child less than six can pick up three languages at the same time as separate entities, one each with its own vocabulary and grammar and all that stuff. But after a child passes six and gets into seven, eight, and nine, and you try to teach a child a language, by then adding one new language is difficult. There's a super learning state that occurs before six. And why is it relevant? Because it's where we get enculturated. It's where we learn the rules of who does what in, you know, in the relationships of the context of family and, and community. And why is consciousness not there? Because the child doesn't have the wherewithal to make rules. So the universe, nature, kept consciousness out for six years until all the rules are downloaded. Does that make sense so far? Now here's the catch. Not only we learn the rules of context of interacting with other people, but we become aware of self-identity. All of us. What kind of self-identity are we talking about? Well, all I have to tell you is go to Kmart near rush hour, and you see this family with a bunch of kids trying to go to the checkout counter, and you see little Billy just, Mommy, Mommy, I won, I won! And you watch the parents, and they'll say, You don't deserve that. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're a sickly child. You can't play sports. You are not pretty. You can't sing. Why is this relevant? If it's before age six, the child is in a hypnagogic trance. It's downloading that as a truth. Where does it go? Subconscious mind. That's where the programs are. Well, let's take a look at that subconscious mind. That's that brain before the conscious evolved. Here's facts about it. It can process approximately 40 million bits of data per second, meaning the conscious, subconscious mind can process 40 million nerve impulses every second. It's extremely fast. Catch. It's totally habitual. It will only play the same response over and over again, whatever was learned. It is the reflex, uh, uh, reflexes and learned tapes. That's where they're stored in our mind, in that subconscious programming. What about consciousness? Ah, that was associated with the prefrontal cortex. It represents self-consciousness. It's an add-on. It's an option. Most people don't exercise this option. <laughs> but look at this. The consciousness can only process about 40 bits per second. Oh, it doesn't process a lot. Yeah, the answer is this. You're in a rainstorm. You go get the telephone number in the phone book at the phone booth, right? It's raining out there, right? You got seven numbers. You get the quarter out of your pocket. Before you get the quarter in the machine, you can't remember the seven numbers again. It doesn't hold a lot of data in it. 40 bits per second, it's slow, but this makes it special. It's creative. It doesn't rely on tapes. With the conscious mind, you can stop a tape and play anything 
at any time if you're conscious of it, right? And the nature is, well, what's the difference in function between the 40 bits and the 40 million bits? There's the numbers. Let me show you a picture. Imagine this picture of Machu Picchu has 40 million little tiny color pixel dots. Each pixel dot represents a nerve stimulus coming into the brain. In one second, the brain subconscious saw this entire picture. How much did the conscious become aware of? And the answer is that much. <laughs> See that? And what's the point? The point is this. Most of your life is run by the subconscious mind. And this is what we now recognize, that the subconscious mind is the most powerful processor that exists in our body. And here's an interesting fact that's been understood, and this is still an underestimate. According to cognitive neuro neuroscientists, we are conscious of only about 5% of our cognitive activity. 95% of your day-to-day -day activity comes from your subconscious mind, not your conscious mind. And it's actually, some people say 99% or more, so we'll give the benefit of the doubt, a little bit of leeway, but it's probably even closer to, to, uh, to uh, maybe 1% or so coming from consciousness and the rest from the subconscious mind. Yeah, but the subconscious mind is the tape programs that you got, okay? And most of the fundamental ones you got were from the process of being uh, in utero development, birthing, and the first six years of your life, where the fundamental programs go into that. Well, why is it relevant? Because people think, oh, well, I'll change my life. I'm going to do positive thinking. Po that's a good idea, positive thinking. Which part of the brain does positive thinking come from? It's conscious or subconscious? Ah, the conscious mind, guess what? It operates about 5% of the day on a 40-bit processor. And guess what? Well, then what's the rest of the stuff coming from? Experiential programs coming from the subconscious mind operating 95% of the day with a 40 million bit processor. You tell me the power of positive thinking it will have on changing a tape in the subconscious mind. And here's where the problem comes from. And it's like, well, you can do it, but you have to use willpower. And I emphasize power. Because the moment you take your eye off the ball, you immediately go back to the pre-programmed tape. Okay? Now, what's, re you know, what's really relevant about all this stuff is that, that the conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind is a tape player. Why is it relevant? The catch. If I give you a cassette tape and say, go home with this tape, put it in your cassette player, play it, uh, and then you go home, you push play, the play, the tape is playing, and you say, oh my god, what a terrible program. You don't like this tape. So you go over to the tape player and say, play something different. I said, I said play something different. Uh, uh, God, would you help me? I mean, this tape is playing the same stupid tape. Go ahead, yell at the tape player, argue with the tape player, jump up and down, get mad at the tape player. And the point is this, I don't care how much yelling you do at the tape player, it will not change the tape. You have to push the record button. And the record button is accessible. You can rewrite your tapes. But if you just become conscious of your issues, you've never changed the tape. You go 10 years to the cognitive therapist, pay thousands of dollars. Yes, my mother did this to me, my father did this to me, my brother did this, and my da 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 da, -da. Guess what? I know all of it. My life is still the same. Why? Awareness in the conscious mind does not transpose itself into a tape in the subconscious mind. To make a tape, you have to go through a learning experience. And there are ways to get to that. Vern Wolf over here, he's going to tell you all the answers about changing the tape because I'm not going to get into that right now. So you ask Vern over here. I'm not doing it. But here's the point. You can rewrite it, but it's a process. Becoming cognitively aware of something in no way changes your tapes. Your tapes are push button, and you've heard people say that. Oh, that guy pushed my buttons. Uh-huh. The tape will automatically play over and over for your entire life until you rewrite the tape. Becoming aware of something does not change it, and that's the failure, because everyone thinks, oh, now that I know all the answers, I came to the seminar, I learned all the answers. You go home, your life is still going to be the same until you change the tape. My conclusions are, Perception controls biology because the environmental signals control the proteins. Perception controls genes because environmental signals control the epigenetic regulatory mechanism. Then in perception can even rewrite my genes. Perception controls biology. Now, the last slide, and then I'll get off the stage, perception test. Because if we're all being run by perception, let's take a test. I'm going to show you two questions. The first one is the sample. The second is only time for one question. We're out of time. So uh, here's, but they're both the same. I show you two surface areas. 
And I say, is surface area A greater than, equal to, or less than surface area B? Is A greater than, equal to, or less than B? And the answer is? Yeah, you see, but that's so obvious and easy. They're square and uniform. Anybody can see that. But if I show you something that's irregular, then you have to do a mind job. You have to look at it and see if can you match the surface areas, depending on where you're sitting, your angle of view, your glasses, your visual acuity. You might get different answers. So I'm going to show you two country, uh, two uh, continents, and I ask you which is greater surface area. You ready? South America or Europe? Is South America greater than, equal to, or less than Europe in surface area? And you have to do the interpolation of space, and you might get a different answer depending on where you're sitting and everything. Got the answer? And the answer is, South America is twice as large as Europe. South America is 6.9 million square miles. Europe is 3.8. Everybody got 100. <laughs> what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The map was made by Germans. <laughs> they put themselves... They put themselves in the dead center of the map. Germany, dead center. What, isn't the equator the dead center? Ah, this map is wrong. You want to see what the right map looks like? It's called the Peter's projection map. Put the equator in the middle, now look at the shape. South America or Europe, which is larger? What's the point? The point is simple. Perceptions are acquired. Some perceptions are right, some perceptions are wrong. Right or wrong, they control your biology. So rather than just saying perceptions control your biology, taking into the fact that we live with a lot of misperceptions, the truth is it's actually belief that controls biology. It's belief. It's what you think. It's what you see. If you think you're healthy and you really truly believe that, you are healthy. But if you were programmed with a belief that you're not, you're not. The final conclusion is simple. Henry Ford said it best. I'll leave you with that. He said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> and what's important about that is you have always been the powerful people on this planet, except you have been programmed of limitations and inabilities and things that you have no power. Why would anybody do that? And I'll give you a simple answer. We live in a world based on a hierarchy of power. If everyone is equally powerful, then how can somebody be more powerful? There's only one way to make you less powerful. And we have been made less powerful to the extent that the powerful people are destroying your planet. And when you know who you are, and recover your power and correct your misperceptions about your frailty and your weakness, you will find that people have been saying all of the time, you are creator gods in this body. And if there's something wrong with the creation, it's your perception. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks a million. Y'all come back now. Cheers. If you like Succeed with Knowledge, subscribe and give us a thumbs up. And thanks a million. Cheers.